Formula One began the 2005 season in Melbourne with an all-new qualifying format. I think the new format is interesting, the aggregate time. I mean, it, it will mix grids up more. You've got twice as much time to get it wrong. Each driver's fastest time from two sessions was taken to set an overall aggregate. And the result was a mixed-up grid with many surprises. Aided by the changeable conditions on Saturday, Renault's new driver Giancarlo Fisichella took pole position for the first time in seven years. Uh, you are on pole by 2.9 seconds. Well, I made fantastic lap. Another shock performance came from the brand new Red Bull Racing Team. Born from the ashes of Jaguar, they qualified a spectacular fifth and sixth. At lights out, Fissi Keller made a fantastic getaway and the Italian was barely pressured throughout the race and easily took the chequered flag. Bravo Fisico! Dai! Bravo! Bravo! That was um, really, really good. I'm really happy. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Having earned his first F1 victory post-race in 2003, this was Fissi Keller's first time on the top step of the podium. Red Bull finished fourth and seventh through David Coulthard and Christian Kleen respectively, both in the points and a dream debut outing. There was chaos and carnage in 2002 as Ralph Schumacher and Rubens Barrichello's accident initiated a chain reaction that wiped out eight cars. Rubens changed the direction twice too much and that was the main problem about it. And the 127,000 spectators were treated to a dramatic race after the restart. Michael Schumacher and Juan Pablo Montoya battled wheel to wheel, while home hero and F1 debutant Mark Webber was hugely overachieving, forcing Mika Salo's Toyota into a mistake and crossing the line in fifth. Salo spun it! Oh, Australia rejoice! I'm sorry, Mika Salo, I'm not against you, but Australia certainly is. He's thrown it away with two laps to go. Mark Webber finishes in fifth place. It's a dream for Australia. It was Minardi's best finish in over eight years. And Weber was given special permission to celebrate on the podium alongside fellow Aussie and team boss Paul Stoddart in front of an adoring crowd. Always one to favour a British-made car if there was one, Sterling Moss entered the 1961 Monaco Grand Prix in an underpowered four-cylinder Lotus. The clear underdog, he was up against a field of works, teams and drivers, including the V6 Ferraris of Richie Ginther and Phil Hill. Moss planted his light and nimble car on pole, but lost out at the start to the more powerful Ferraris. But Moss, with his side panels removed for cooling, fought back and by lap 13 had caught and passed Ginther to take the lead. Over the next 87 laps, Moss drove with metronomic precision. The snarling, shark-nosed Ferraris attempted to chase him down. But Moss kept the prancing horses behind, consistently lapping three seconds faster than his qualifying time to maintain the lead. The flag finally fell for Moss to mark his third victory in Monte Carlo, a feat no other driver had accomplished at the time. He would later remark, that it was the race of his life. A race is never over until you cross the line, something Carlos Reutemann knows firsthand. The deafening cheers on the third lap of the 1974 Argentine Grand Prix could mean only one thing. Reutemann had taken the lead. Despite building a substantial gap at the front, as the race headed towards its conclusion, the tension in the crowd started to rise. The spectators could hear Reutemann's engine cutting out through the corners, and Denny Holm was almost on top of him. And as he started his penultimate lap, Holm sailed past. A misfiring engine had cost the Brabham driver what had looked to be a famous victory, one which would have been his first, but he would eventually drop to seventh by the flag. Redemption wasn't long in coming though, as Reutemann won just two races later with victory at the South African Grand Prix. It was one of Formula One's hottest ever races, with temperatures rising to 40 degrees Celsius. 
Many drivers had to pull into the pits due to exhaustion. But after a remarkable three-hour drive, Fangio crossed the line to take victory for Mercedes. In all, 16 driver swaps took place, and race officials were forced to bring in an accounting firm to work out the results. Quite a dramatic start to a season. The season had barely begun at the 1982 South African Grand Prix before the drama started. The Fédération Internationale du Sport, or FISA, a forerunner of the FIA, had issued new requirements for drivers' super licenses, and they were not happy about it. Amid everyone's disbelief, drivers boarded a coach, left the track, and went on strike, forcing Thursday's practice sessions to be cancelled. While the cars and their mechanics sat at the circuit ready to run, the drivers, with their backs against a wall, holed up in a hotel in Johannesburg. Intense negotiations between team bosses, ruling bodies and the striking drivers went on, but no one at the circuit knew whether a Grand Prix would take place or not. We're not looking forward to a postponement, but at worst, the race will definitely be on the following Saturday. I think the drivers have a certain right, and uh, what they're asking for isn't unreasonable. As the day drew on, FISA offered an ultimatum. Either the drivers turn up at 7 o'clock the next morning, or they would have their license revoked and face a lifetime ban. The drivers, however, stood together and slept together, with the Grand Prix Drivers Association hiring a conference suite at the hotel for all the drivers to stay in overnight. Mattresses were strewn across the floor, while Elio De Angelis and Gilles Villeneuve played on a grand piano to keep everyone entertained. Given verbal assurances by Jean-Marie Ballest, the FISA president, the Grand Prix eventually took place as planned. But he reneged on his deal and subsequently fined all drivers involved before issuing race bans that had to be overturned in the FIA's Court of Appeal. A truly remarkable situation that made headlines all over the world. Jody Schechter lined up in 11th place for the start of the 1977 Argentine Grand Prix in a Walter Wolf Racing WR1 car, the team making its Formula One debut. And few had high expectations for their chances. All focus was on the lead racers, James Hunt, John Watson and Nicky Lauda battling for top honours. But the searing heat pushed many into mistakes and reliability issues also helped thin the field, leaving Schechter to close on the leaders. With six laps to go, he flew past Carlos Pace and drove off into an incredible 40-second lead. For Schechter and Walter Wolf, it was a joyous, albeit rather fortuitous, maiden victory on debut, a feat few constructors have ever achieved. 1994 marked a changing of the guard in Formula One, and it was evident from the very first race in Sao Paulo. Home hero Ayrton Senna took his 63rd pole position in his first outing for the Williams team. But a young Michael Schumacher had been biting at his heels all weekend in his Benetton. The pair in a class of their own. Senna got away well while Schumacher dropped behind the fast-starting Ferrari of Jean Alesi. But he quickly regrouped and took second place back on lap two. He reeled Senna in, breaking the lap record before the first round of pit stops. Coming in on the same lap, the race was in the hands of the two pit crews. Schumacher is out ahead of Ayrton Senna. There is the Brazilian. And Michael Schumacher has taken the lead in the Brazilian Grand Prix. The pair continued their battle, negotiating back markers and managing to avoid the chaos of Jos Verstappen's huge crash with Martin Brundle and Eddie Irvine. They touch wheels, Verstappen loses it on the grass, they collect Brundle, Verstappen up in the air, Verstappen rolls. Miraculously doesn't land on his head. That is one big accident. But in pushing hard to close the gap, Senna made an uncharacteristic mistake spinning out of the race, with the crowd in disbelief. Schumacher cruised home to claim the third win of his career and kick off two years of incredible success. Ferrari spent the winter leading into the 1989 season attempting to get F1's first semi-automatic gearbox to work correctly, but hadn't managed it before the first Grand Prix at Rio de Janeiro. Nigel Mansell's car had broken down in three of the four sessions before the race, and the Briton had been so convinced of his Ferrari's unreliability that he'd even booked an early flight home. 
but from lights out he drove an impeccable and precise race, passing Ricardo Patrese in a flash of sparks to take the lead. Mantle's taking the lead. And I can almost hear the cries of joy from Italy as Nigel Mansell in the Ferrari takes the lead on lap 16. And his only edgy moment came during a pit stop, where surprised onlookers watched as five wheels were changed, the four tyres and the steering wheel. Nothing else, though, got in his way, and Mansell marched to a 14th Grand Prix victory and temporarily put a stop to McLaren's dominance. I was optimistic, but I never thought... Uh... <laughs> I can't really say it for one minute that I expected it to keep going, but I mean, I'm still finding it hard to believe now, but yeah, it's great. It's just great to be back here again. Fairy tales don't come much better than the story of the 2009 Australian Grand Prix. After a nightmare winter in which Honda rocked the sporting world by pulling out of Formula One, it was a miracle that the Brackley-based team, now renamed as Braun GP following a takeover led by Ross Braun, even made it to Albert Park. The team had been saved by the skin of their teeth and arrived in Melbourne ready to show they meant business after a promising showing in pre-season testing as they'd taken advantage of a major regulation change to build a car with the now famous double diffuser which had given them a downforce advantage. With such a tumultuous pre-season, few thought their momentum could continue but Jensen Button and Rubens Barrichello qualified first and second, then flew to a 1-2 finish, with Barrichello fighting his way back to second place after an awful start. Well done, well done. Great result, Jensen. Sensational job. Sensational job, Jensen. Fantastic. Well done. You deserve it. The emotion was overwhelming for many in the team, who just weeks earlier had been unsure whether they'd even had jobs, let alone whether they'd be winning races. It was a truly remarkable comeback.